check, uh, check. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. You sound great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, bro. Good. I don't hear the mad echo, dude. I could hardly think over how bad it was echoing. There's got to be some type of impedance issue. I have a, it must have an overload with too much technology, and it keeps. It was making my main camera dashboard cut out, so yeah. I didn't trust it, and I tried to go manual, but then you couldn't hear me. So then I switched over, bro. I got the Sure SM7B. I got the Rodecaster Pro, the A10 Mini Pro. I got 4K HDMI's, 12 monitors, shit all over the place, bro. And everything works perfect. But if you if you change one little thing to fix it. It can make everything go down. You don't know why. And I'm sitting here troubleshooting live. Yeah. <laughs> You're gone when it still said live. I'm like, this is this is real life business. Figure it out. <laughs> I'm in, in. putting them out, man. Yeah. So, all right. So back to where we were going. Getting out of the field. That yeah, bro. Out of the field, man hour rates, being a control freak loosening the grip on your business. And every time you try to grow a little or hire somebody or, or put something new into your business, it, the chaos factor takes off, which is the fear of the unknown can take over. And then you have to uh, go through that learning curve and be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Can you talk about all this shit, man? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, dude, we just had the perfect example of it right now. You know, this, what it just happened to you just happens with more people and there's bigger numbers of it going all the time you got to pull your shit together with your gear and one little thing goes and then it you know it screws up everything else right and, and that's exactly what happens in business you know uh, where i was going originally was i was saying that you know we get so caught up on wanting things done a certain way that we become control freaks and it makes it possible to delegate things and, and people might still get an acceptable result right we they do the job they do the thing and it's a good result and we're mad just because it wasn't done the way we are. Like almost every business or the way we would do it. Almost every business owner I know has that exact same thing happen to them. So where you said, like being able to let it go a little bit, that's challenging. But even to a bigger extent, you know, I, I always tell everybody because I'll have perfectionists work for me and I have people that are, are way too lax work for us. And and I'll tell them it's like, you know, there's a when I worked in the body shop, there's an you know, there's a 1996 Ford F-150, and then there is a brand new Ferrari, and both need to be maintained different ways. Like, there's so many different ways you've got to think about business, right? What you do on the 96 Ford is not acceptable for the Ferrari, and we all deal with different properties like this. Like, whether we think, you know, unfortunately, our ideal our ideal client can have a multitude of different things, and being able to let go of this. The, the other big thing that happens is, us as business owners, or especially if you're trying to be a control freak because you're, you're afraid of messing up and not making enough money or whatever the case may be, we see these little mistakes and we're like, dude, if I don't get it done, I don't get paid. I'm not going to be able to afford the things. The next person's not going to buy. And it really lets us, it really blocks us from the reality. Like there is perfection way over here and there is total garbage over here and just a little bit over is acceptable. And anywhere from acceptable to perfection is totally fine with everybody. And so, honestly, I'm not saying you should let your quality go if you're wanting to delegate. But you got to understand there's going to be things that come up. Like we had someone uh, in this office right to my right is our admin who is working on scheduling all the mowing in Florida. And she's learning more and more of that. And she had a mistake today where something didn't get dispatched. So the team didn't see it. You know, back in the day, that would have freaked me out. Now I'm just like, show me so I can show you how to fix that moving forward into the future so we can get that right. I don't care about mistakes. The more mistakes you make, as long as you don't keep doing them over and over again, the faster we learn, the faster we grow. And so you talk about getting out of the field, like have an office admin. I took a video as I was walking around here. If we would have went live earlier, I would have showed you like all three offices had people in them and they were all on the phone hammering through stuff. And I know that's a much different level than someone who's just wanting to get out of the field and wanting to start being doing some of the office stuff. But it's all the same thing. You know, you're going to be, I've always been afraid of like running out of money or not having enough money or this, that, and the other, but you've got to separate those fears. And yeah, it's what you said. It's going to be uncomfortable. You got to do uncomfortable stuff. You got to see guys do stupid stuff because it's not exactly what you'd want. Or I uh, mean, Keith, you've talked to me about it before you see a guy out there and you're just like, how is this taking so long? Or what, you know, how did you miss the thing? You know, 
Um, and there's so many things you got to put in place to, to try to, to try to avoid those like video stuff, you know, show the team what needs to be done on a video so they don't miss things, good plans, good notes, all that. Um, but getting out of the field is a lot about letting a little stuff go so you can actually get to the big picture. If you're wanting that, I mean, if you want to have a small company, that's totally cool. But if you're wanting to really grow, you've got to realize there's going to be issues and it's us as a whole getting there together. Um, Real quick, just for some context yeah. in your business, what, what cities are you in? What's the size of your business and what services do you offer? Like what's the name of your business? So people who don't know you can be like, get some context of who you are and what you do. A hundred percent because you're got to get me going on something. I get jazzed. About. Go, 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 go. And you got to stop me. Sometime. So um, we are in Illinois, Springfield, Illinois. We're in Cape Coral, Florida. Uh, last year between the two, we did like 3.6 million. Um, so, you know, Illinois is already over doing over a couple million a year. Florida did 1.6. It was our, like our 18 months business down here. This year, both of them will do over two million. We're we're shooting for somewhere between three to four here in Florida, and you know we're shooting for three in Illinois, and um, yeah, it's been super fun. We so stopped. you're doing lawn mowing, landscapes, retaining yep. walls, patios, drainage. Yeah. That's what, what are you doing? That's, that's what I'm getting to. It's been super fun, but what we realized is in Illinois we did way too many services, and that makes it much more harder to do what we're talking about in Illinois. We do. <laughs> Gutter cleaning, pressure washing, uh, mowing, fertilizing, excavation, retaining walls, pavers, um, you name it, we do it outside. Uh, you, uh, brush clearing. Yeah, I, I can't. The list, the list is too big. We're condensing the list to the things we're really good at. Yeah, we do drainage. You said that. Um, lighting installs. Uh, just, just anything. How do you, <laughs> anything How do you even teach employees all that shit? It's crazy. Really have luck and we crank through it and we do all that and we still make money, you know, and we've started. Well, I tried too many services and I was pulling my hair out. I did. I, I failed miserably trying to do it. And I had to go back down to the few services. How do you do that? Well, I'm going where I'm going here is we are shrinking it's because you're such a genius and you can oh. wake up and go to the gym and eat fucking steak for breakfast. Oh, steak give us the answer. Godar. No, like, you, what you said is right. Like producing the services, basically the things that we suck at, we're getting rid of. In Florida, we're more profitable because we're honed in. Like we, we mow lawns, we do pool. Those are like one in the same here. Like the mow crew does both, and then we have landscaping, and that's it. So you know, like light landscaping and LED, like lighting, very general around the house with planting, and it's super repeatable. So that's why we make so much more money here and we're so much more profitable because it's easy and we've got it down to where a bunch of people can learn it. And so since I separated from Illinois, the reason we were able to do it is because I was heavily, heavily involved in everything and any service. I, we learned it because I was the person who probably did it first. I mean, heck, we used to finish concrete. I was the guy that finished concrete. Like that's why we got out of concrete because concrete couldn't get finished. Unless, unless Jacob was there. Exactly. <laughs> so, so we're reducing those jobs and, you know, we obviously we try to hire skilled people that can do a big set of those things. And a lot of those things are so general. You know, there's so many things in the service industry that are pretty general. And if you have a skilled person, they can do a lot of them. But we're really we're always looking with the team now. The, the answer to get to what you're saying is like be asking the people you're around, like, what other services do we want to add and what should we get rid of and, and ruthlessly get rid of because we're just not good at. And that's where it goes to the man hour rate thing. You know, I don't really need to like be like, I mean, I pick what services we do and what we don't do based off of we know our man hour rate. We know what it needs to be for certain sectors of our business. You know, it's going to vary a little bit between landscaping and lawn treatment. The mowing there's a spread there and i know mm. hitting our numbers uh, and, and we consistently can't hit our numbers we're going to drop drop the service it's either we're so if you can't consistently hit the numbers you need to hit in your man hour rates according yep. to the spread and i'm sure you have it all dialed in mathematically scientifically exact then you have to drop that service yeah yeah we're not going to do something Obviously, there's training. Like when you first say you're going to start a landscaping business and all you do is softscaping and you're trying to keep it easy, you're not going to be that efficient until you really learn what you're doing. So there's an amount of time that's a given. You've got to learn. After you have given it enough time to try to learn, 
you still can't be profitable at the thing, yeah, we would 100% drop a service. And that's how we like figure out the services we want to market more. You know, we look at the services we're highly profitable at. That's one. So how do you define profitable? Is profitable where everybody's making money, the owner's making money, and the business is making some money? Or is profitable like to the point where you can eventually offer, I don't know if you do or not, like your employees' health insurance and benefits packages and, and for growth? Like how do you define profitable? So profitable would be, obviously very different for other people or for different people, right? Like me, I want a certain number. Like our goal is to get to 30% net profit. That's our goal in the business, you know? And so with that being said, I do offer all those things and that's, what's going to make it like very different, but that percent like can be a goal for anybody, whether you offer a little or offer a lot, like you still have that big percent goal, whatever that is. So for us, it's 30, you know, um, that's different for each location. Illinois has been getting better and better. It's in the 13 to 14% range last year. Florida's a little over 20 now, you know, they're, they're trickling up in the right direction. And so we do to go into those things, we do offer uh, a 401k with a three and a half percent match. And um, we do have health insurance. We do have, um, you, you know, paid holidays for pretty much every holiday under the sun. We do events. Heck, our, like a lot of our Florida team just got back from a nine mile tough mudder that, you know, the company paid for uh, axe throwing in Illinois, axe throwing. I mean, we do a bunch of stuff together to really try to promote culture. And that's a, that's a whole different side of all of this. But to me, it's a number, like I've always wanted to push that percentage towards 20, 30, it really as high as we can get it so we can afford doing more things that are going to make the team better, whether that be in the form of a benefit or whether that be in the form of a bonus, like everything structured around, you know, really watching our profit. All of our team, like our, our landscapers, they get incentive money if they hit certain profit percentages. The the Mo team, they get they get incentive if they bring in a certain amount of money a day plus hit their hourly rate. Like if a Mo team brings in over a thousand dollars a day and they do it at sixty five dollars a man hour from the time they clock in to the time they clock out, they can get up to three dollars and three dollars an hour extra over the whole course of their week. So there's a lot of different things in place and and I you know you know Caleb Almond as well. And I was talking yeah. to about some of the stuff is God, you got to have a lot of people watching that shit. And you do, I mean it, but it's all grown with us a little bit at a time. You know, we a little bit more and a little bit more. And you're talking about getting out of the field that all starts with, you know, really just separating and getting some people doing the work and start to learn about management and stop thinking that like this business being good is all about being a good technician because business being good is not about being a good technician. It's about understanding a business understanding the numbers and understanding how we can try to, <laughs> to work together and actually produce something for us. So well, I just had a vision. Imagine like you're at a picnic table and there's like the ships with all the cargo. It's your business and employees. Yep. And you're over here and you got like a chess board and you got a little a sharp pocket knife and you're, you're carving chess pieces out of wood. Like Michelangelo, you're building systems. You're over here doing deep work, bro. And one of the ships is on fire. And every time you, put down your high level system creation stuff, mm -hmm. the brain stuff to go run and put out the fire. But if you don't, that ship's going to sink. So yeah. do you eventually have other people putting out fires for you? How do you get yourself in a Zen like state so you can actually do growth related deep, deep topic things and have, you got a wife and kids and you got all this stuff going on, all these employees. Yeah. That's a really good question, right? And obviously it's not all day long that I get to do Zen stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of fire putting out. I don't, I focus on like, Hey, here's the 90, I, I do like 90 day planning and I know what I want to try to get done this week. I'll have a few. Wait, hours. wait, 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 you schedule time to do planning or you just, yeah. say, oh, I'm just going to plan today. Or do you, you schedule planning in? So you, you plan planning. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But not super. Don't don't over <laughs> how hardcore this is. Yesterday, I just said, hey, I got an hour. Or last Thursday, I'm like, I got an hour to think about what the game plan, what the goals are for the next 90 days. Okay. And then what do you do, you know, daily to hit those goals? You know, in, Flor in Florida, our next big targets, like we want a $300,000 a month, right? After that, that would be a $400,000 a month. And so, like, what are the biggest pieces that I can contribute to help get those things? You know, so and what are they? What What is the role that you play in your business for me specifically? Now it's all big, big picture stuff. You know, I tomorrow I have a lunch to 
potentially buy out a company that's doing around half a million in sales here in Florida. And then later at three, I'm looking at a new shop to expand and have more storage space because we don't really have a good shop set up. We're pretty much just in a professional office here in Florida and we use parking areas for all of our equipment. And so it's, it's bigger stuff that's going to move the thing as a whole. And, and that's the little questions you're asking are really good for this overall topic because the big problem happens is when you're one person and you start a lawn and landscape business and you go out and you do the thing, you, you, you weedy, you mow, you shovel, you're really influencing a hundred percent of the revenue. Once that gets to 10 people, if you go out and do the same thing, now all you do is influence 10% of the revenue and that just keeps going down and down and down and down. And so if you don't start doing tasks that influence the whole thing, I want to push a lever. If I have 10 employees, I want to push a lever that affects everything. I don't want to push a lever that only contributes 10% to the whole. So I guess what's lot that of- lever? I mean, that levers, levers a lot of things. Is it ever changing? Always, always. Because when I started in Florida, we went from nothing to a, a fair amount of stuff going on in a short amount of time. I mean, we, in our first nine months here in Florida, we did like 480,000 in sales. And then the first rolling year after that, 1.6 million in sales. So things change really, really fast. Along a lot of that time period, though, the biggest priority for me was sell stuff. You know, and I've already done the get out of the field once. So for me to get out of the field, I need to hire as many people as possible in the field to keep work running. And I need to get someone in the office to help answer phone calls and keep customer service. That's just been the that's been the mathematical form for me. So that's what I did when I came to Florida. Got someone in the office ASAP and I started trying to get some people figured out in the field. And then my goal every day was to go sell stuff. So go to network meetings, go hang door hangers, go do whatever. I got at least an eight hour day. And if I don't have anything, I'm going to do something that would create those things. Door hangers, knocking on doors, anything, calling people. Um, so so for a amount of time from then until probably the last four months in Florida, it's been my whole responsibility to sell as much stuff as possible all the time. And in the last probably three or four months, we've now hired someone in sales. And so that she does all the sales here in Florida. I do a very, very little part. Like so far this spring, I'm looking at my dashboard right here. I've sold like 73,000 in sales this year. Yeah. Bree sold $433,000 in projects. So like I sell nothing compared to her now. Now, and, wait, wait, is she selling them going out in the field and quoting? Yeah. Or, yep. Okay. So, so interesting. Cause I'm thinking about the scheduling and scheduling nightmare that all this creates. I know in my business say, um, well, I, I got so sick of answering the phones that my wife answers a lot of the phones and does the scheduling as like a receptionist and then yep. Jill's office, taking the overflow phone calls and doing all the, for any of the hours that my wife can't. And then me going out and doing all the marketing and sales and then having a crew out doing all the labor and all the work. And just at my smaller level, if a guy can't show up on a Monday, it causes, you know, uh, a whole bunch of phone calls that I have to make that's really frustrating or that my wife has to make or something like that to to keep everything, your promises to all these customers. So if you have 16, 20, 30 employees and people can't show up on Mondays or they're late or they don't tell you they had a dentist appointment, you have to have all these policies and procedures in place to detach your emotion from getting frustrated to like make it how do you systematize that stress and communication? I love, like, I love the stuff. Like there's, you're going in so deep and so (laughs) (laughs) answers to all this. What I'm going to tell you, one of the big struggles for me that I can flat out tell any contractor do what we're doing. Like there was a time where I didn't have enough employees and it was a frantic frustration because anybody gone was a nightmare. And that, (laughs) changing the more and more crew got and then just recently we had uh for growcom here we had uh my last boss he was one of the speakers here at training day and he brought up a thing that i'm like dude why didn't you tell me this forever ago that's genius and we talked about it uh we talked about it in the car before he came here like a month ahead of time and it was just as simple as contingency planning right so you're talking about a team member what are you doing Settle down. I'm getting my shit right here. You think I'm not going to take notes? Contingency planning. Yeah, it was just as simple as called contingency planning. And basically, you know, he would, he had a body shop, right? 
And the mentor that named our business, I don't even think I said the name of the business, Scooter's Lawn Care. I was supposed to say that earlier. It's really easy for me to get off track. But the the person that helped name the business Lawn Care, he put a room at Zara's, the body shop, the guy I'm telling you about. And Brad, the owner who came here and was, had said, man, a guy wouldn't show up and a car couldn't go out that day. And then I had pissed off people. And Jimmy, guy who helped me name Scooter's Lawn Care, said, Brad, what's the contingency plan? Brad's looking at him like, well, we do the work tomorrow because we're screwed and we can't do it today. That's the that's the contingency plan. He's like, no, you're supposed to have someone else for that to fall into their hands, to manage that, to make sure it still happens. And basically what happened and what he said is what we went to. We overhire people now. We have more people than all the time because where I used to think, man, I can't afford extra people. And it's going to cost us too much money. I realized it's the exact opposite. Having extra oh. people allows us every, every day you say that a job doesn't go because someone's not there. Well, that costs you so much in potential revenue that you would have got done. If you just had someone extra step in and keep that job moving forward, it would way outweigh not being a job. And that was the same thing they realized. They realized they had 27 employees and with so much time off that if they just overhired four extra employees to cover cover several positions it it was like a net positive because they were still able to keep things rolling and they didn't lose any money even though and this had- is a math equation yeah a little bit a little bit i will say well, that people involved obviously but it's math yeah and you know mine's less like i will say a lot of what i do is i run 100 miles an hour forward yes i get mathematical about stuff and yes i try to make sure it's right but we hire, we push, we, we add people. And then we, we kind of shake it out as it goes because I figured out his contingency plan because about a year ago here in Florida, we got down to where we didn't have enough employees. And I promised the team, give me a week and we'll never have it happen again. And from that point on, I told everybody we're, we're interviewing at first, it was two, two interviews a week forever. And then, then it became four interviews a week forever. And so we're always interviewing. We're always hiring. We're always probably potentially doing some firing or someone's leaving too, you know, because there's certain positions that <laughs> now you got an HR department in this month. Yeah. I mean, there's attrition, right? Like there's people that are going, you've had people walk off, you've had people leave, you had to fire people. And the whole goal is to have people sitting on the bench or someone that you like that you just met. Even if you, just because you interview people doesn't mean you have to hire them. Hey, I'm putting names and faces and I'm trying to see if you'd be a candidate for a future position. Because a lot of these people, the best employees are working somewhere else and they got to do two weeks notification anyway before they quit if they really care about their job. So even if I offer them a job, they might not be able to start right now. So I'm trying to find everybody, have them sitting on the bench to potentially be working for us in the future. I've been been able to identify one thing. Most people, I can relate to this. I'm not saying all, maybe it's a smaller percentage than most. Let's say some landscapers yep. are running their businesses scared with one foot on the brake. Oh yeah. And it, so it seems to me that <laughs> you're this motherfucking NASCAR foot on the gas yeah, directly into your fears and pains. Just yeah. head on. Uh-huh. Talk about that, bro. Dude, uh, that's the, you I, ain't you, no bitch, bro. Let's go. Uh, like oh, shit, so- I said a word that you can't <laughs> say no more. Sorry. No, it's all good. You're, you're, okay way right like and i think a lot of it came from me having the relationship with racing motorcycles like i've went through a lot and almost died over there and so doing this i realized that like no matter what the mistake is i'm not going to die you know worst case in business is you go bankrupt and like whatever you know like a lot of people go bankrupt and come back and, and the super successful people have done it more than once and i'm not saying anybody could aspire to do that by any means or be reckless but i'm saying that like everything that happens business is a potential opportunity to learn and yeah the really the things that have helped me grow the most have me being under have been me being under pressure all the time and i think it's why i'm getting into like the the hardcore long distance running stuff now too i i I told my my wife sent me a meme the other day and it said i the, the meme said i run early in the morning so the rest of my day won't suck that bad ah yeah and so now I bought a cold plunge and I get in a 50 degree cold plunge right before I met or right after I make my coffee in the morning. And it, 
the rest of my day is not going to be that excruciating. So I'm looking for those hard things and I run into the hard things because that's what's going to help us build the company. And, and oh, so you're doing this alpha male stress management type stuff. Bro. That, but that's that's side notes to all of what we're already talking about. Yeah, I, I'm always doing something goofy doing and cold plunges or cycles or whatever. But but what you said is like going into these things, you stack the ability to learn that you're going to get through struggles a little bit at a time. Like what Keith had a hard time with four years ago would probably be pretty easy to Keith now, you know, and that's how it is for everybody. So I just try to keep adding those as quickly as possible. So I keep trying to bite bigger and bite bigger and bite bigger to grow the company and push things forward because I realized over time that everything I get put up against, I already go in knowing I'm going to figure it out. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it looks like I'm going to lose it all or whatever the situation is. I'm going to figure it out. So your mindset and your worldview is one that's proactive. You're like, I'm, I don't care what it is. I'm going to figure this out. I got this. Yeah. So yeah. what about some people? So there's there's a fear that says, if I'm so overwhelmed with just what I have going on now, I, I, my, my bandwidth is already too maxed out. I don't even know how the hell I'm going to handle that. So people are afraid to pull the the lever that grows their business yeah. and they're trapped because they're, they can't even handle what they got going on now. And it feels impossible it feels overwhelming like they're going to miss more events with families or miss date night or not get to the kids dance recital or or even miss the funeral or like because because when you're growing your business i mean i did i've straight up showed up to family events covered in dirt exhausted sunburn falling asleep at the table yep. so so how, how do you how do you like navigate those i know it's a big question but yeah i i love this because these are all huge questions where we could go in any direction on um, there's a lot of different things we could hit on. And like for that, if you're stressed out in business and you're that wired and freaked out, like you got to figure out like what the priorities are and you got to figure out like if you're that maxed out on bandwidth. Yeah. You only have as like a percentage as a pie, you've only got the a hundred percent. Right. And you get chipping away at that with all these different things that happens. One of the worst things I see like a person with a bunch of relationship problems and that eats up 99%. <laughs> And, and, and it happens. To, I mean, I know that because if me and my wife are not jiving and we're fighting about something or I just like, I, I, I feel like I've done something where I'm like, oh, <laughs> try to make her happy about it because I've, I've been a dick, whatever. Like, it takes all my bandwidth because I care so much about things, but same thing happens with business. And if you've got a bunch of different things and you're overwhelmed, you got to look at like, what hats can I take off? And then if you're like, well, I can't take hats off because I can't afford to pay anybody. Well, then you need to go back and focus on how the hell do I make more profit? Because if I can't afford to pay anybody, it means I'm not making enough money. And if I'm going to have to grow, I'm going to have to hire people. So I need to start with figuring out how to make some money. And if you can't figure it out, that's where you network with people. You get with other business owners, you find mentors and show them. It's like, you're not on an Island. Everybody else has had these problems too. So you can get to the point where you can hand things off because I couldn't do any of this stuff without a bunch of people on my side. Like could not keep up with the YouTube stuff I do without someone editing and uploading the videos could not keep up. Like that there's people in both offices that. Uh, and uh, yeah, just couldn't you got be fired up. Yeah. Just couldn't do it without people. So you have to figure out a way to get other people on your team and keep building that team so you can handle more and more. But you also have to get a shit ton of work and have a shit ton of employees driving money so you can hire people. You know, like my goal now is to get as many people in the office. Well, no, I shouldn't. That's wrong. That is, I wish we could redact that from the statement. But <laughs> I want people overall. And because I do have a few field techs that I see the opportunity to make it to. I want to get as many six figures a year as possible. That's one of my big goals. As many what? As many of my team mem team members making over six figures as possible. That's one of my big goals. So you have goals beyond your fearful, selfish self. You're thinking, I'm not saying that's you, but I'm, I'm talking, drawing uh, this dynamic bandwidth, this juxtaposition and comparison mm -hmm. to instead of being thinking about me, 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 I, you're thinking about elevating your team members. You're thinking about culture. You're thinking about, you're asking yourself bigger, higher quality questions. Yeah. Yeah. Because I couldn't like, yeah, obviously we all want to be, I mean, this is a, it's capitalism, right? Like we all want to 
build companies, grow more, make more money. Um, but like the ability to give back and help my team earn more money. Like that's, that's the cool thing because that's, what's going to take you like all the way. It's very, the whole keep it small and keep it all type of mentality is never going to get you real, real far. Like I want to have a jet someday or at least sometimes <laughs> I want to be able to do like Andy Frisilla said something awesome. Your dreams should be so huge that all of your employees dreams can fit inside of your dream. You yes. know, and that's where, that's where my mind's at. Like I looked at the, uh, the Callie is the person I keep pointing over this way. She's in that office. And I looked at her, and we were talking about stuff and I'm like, if my goal was to make 80 grand a year, how do you feel about working here that knowing that's my ceiling? to make 80 grand a year. How much do you think you're going to make in your life? You know, working here. And so, so yeah, it's, it's way beyond me because I know that as a team, you know, you want to go fast, do it alone. You want to go far, do it together. And as a team, we're going to be able to accomplish so much that goes back to, I need all these people to help me create stuff. Couldn't do it without them. I could like all the times I'm at events and doing all the stuff like last, the last like month and a half, I've been gone for a week, every other week flying somewhere some of it's business related a lot of it's business conferences and that's trying to learn more to do more to help this mindset and everything we're talking about and like i could never do those things without badass awesome dude we got awesome people and um and that takes a lot you're talking about these people with a fearful mindset not being able to hand anything off it this shit didn't come overnight and no. none of it easy and it's still hard are you working close with your bookkeeper and your accountant or like a business coach or consultant, somebody above you that helps you kind of map this stuff out and see in order to be here this quarter or next year, we have to hit these profit margins, these goals, these percentages. Are you, do you, do you have a budget that you're reviewing often? Um, so, and this is where everybody needs to figure out what their wheelhouse is in their business, right? For me, my wheelhouse is numbers. I love numbers. Like it's been one of the things that's probably helped me, is that was the only thing I was good at in school. Like everybody else hated everything. I hated math. I love math. And um, so to answer your question, which is a great question and everybody should have, yes, I have an accountant that is badass. They are on top of our books for everything. They do all of our payroll. They almost act kind of like a partial CFO, but I'm still the person setting those metrics. I'm doing the budgeting. I'm setting like, these are the targets, but it's not just me. It goes back to what we talked about. It's me and my team. So if we, or my team and I, I should say, um, when we get together in spring, we're bringing the budget to the table and each group is going and we're looking, it's like, where do we think we can hit next year? With that being said, let's put in all these rates to figure out where we need to be in each division. And well, okay, we're going to add in another office person that's going to add to overhead and, and then look at what that puzzle looks like for this year, which then is going to spit out like, okay, we need this much in landscaping. We need this much in mowing and we need this much in this sector. And then we kind of can divvy it up from there. And is it going to shake out exactly? No, because all budgets and stuff, it's all made up anyway. It's just to, <laughs> just to be a guide, a guiding point of some kind of path. And so say it says we need to do 500,000 of mowing. Well, maybe we only do 300,000, but we do 300,000 in excess of our budget in landscaping, you know, or whatever the numbers come out to be. So, so there's, yeah. There's this quick thing. I had this other visual real quick. So some people feel like they're, like they're on the surfboard and the wave keeps pummeling them. <laughs> they're like, how the fuck am I going to, but that's this interesting thing is when you go for it and you become a hundred percent committed and you get on the surfboard and now you're cresting the wave moment by moment, you're riding the wave, you're in control. It's like, I feel this, this thing that uh, you, you're in this very proactive alpha. And I don't mean alpha male because there's alpha beta delta theta. There's these different, this is state of consciousness mm -hmm. where you realize you take 100% responsibility and accountability for your business. Yep. It's kind of like that t-shirt, like everything is my fault. Yep. So what is the transition point or the transcendent point between being somebody who feels like they're at an effect in their business or a victim to actually getting on top and making shit like this happen? What was the shift for you? Or was it multiple shifts over time? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I always had a really good mindset, right? And I, 
I think I could contribute some of that to that last person I worked for got me into like conferences and self-development. He was my first exposure to that. He sent me to something and um, it taught me a lot. And I've always known how important mindset was. I mean, that's in racing. It's the same way. Like a porn mindset won't help you in anything. And so one of the things I just, I think I, I feel like I just got lucky. Like I didn't ever really have a victim mindset. I knew it would not serve me. I watched so many victims around me. And then, you know, from that self-development thing he sent me to, and then shortly into my business from reading, educating and other stuff, I really stayed away from like a victimhood mindset. And I don't know, there's no, like, how do you switch that? Like, so you were able to recognize a victimhood mindset when it came up or like the whack-a-mole game, you could just hit that fucker whenever it started to pop up or if you you were able to get so far upstream that it didn't even occur to you yeah i mean a lot of my stuff would be like i would just look at myself and be like hey you know you can't complain like i would really like look at myself and be like you just can't be a little bitch about this like you can't you know you there's no one cares if i cry and whine and play victim none of my employees care about that right and the, yeah, there are times where i have i'm not some perfect superhero by any means but i know that that's been one of my strong suits that's why when we talk about mindset or something i love talking about mindset i don't know what it was that made it that way i feel like a lot of it was racing because when you race motorcycles you would break bones and if you could physically still ride you would and you had all these things where you would go no matter what you know and um, i feel like that's helped me a lot in business to not get stuck and and say why me because it first, just first time we really hung out uh with that restaurant in miami everybody was drinking and hanging out and talking and i look over at the table you're over there by yourself just fucking chilling <laughs> i'm like this guy's different and i go sit down i'm like what's up bro Jacob Godard, bro, what up? And I'm talking to you for a second, and you're like, oh, I'm just about to go to this Tony Robbins event. I'm trying to hit 10 million. <laughs> like, everybody's everybody's chilling and having a good time, and you're just, we call it monomaniacally focused. I, Robin Sharma said that. I keep thinking about that, man. And now I've tracked, well, I'm not tracking, I just see you on, on the internet. We talk time to time, and I see you just over the past, what, 2018, 19, 20, 20 five years, you just hockey sticked. Yep. And so can you contribute a lot of that to going to conferences and getting oh, yeah. around other people that are that you're looking up to where they're at? hundred percent. And then I would think that that would be when you're asking, like, how do you get out of that victim mindset? If you know or have success in your business and that you think that could be a contributing factor, that would be something huge. You know, for me, it wasn't the victim mindset of anything. It was just I was always had this big scarcity around money. That was my biggest issue in business. And that's why I started really going to that to get over that. But conferences and being around people, the network it's given me, you know, the, the people it's put me next to, the, the people that had said, hey, I believe in you if you needed money or you wanted whatever, or, or on the housing side of things, people saying, oh, you know, I'd be a hard money lender if you want to flip houses. Like it, it's gave me all of this connections for people that we can all work together and help on stuff and it's good. so you're not afraid to invest in yourself and take out your credit card and spend one two three four five grand plus plane tickets at flights and hotel to invest in your education you take out your credit card and you pay for high level advice yeah 100 percent. like my my wife just texted me and said this is going good and uh, <laughs> Must be watching she's gonna hear this and this is me bragging on i've got the most amazing wife in the entire world and she's fucking incredible and i don't know how i could do any of this without her and you know amen every person's only as good as the person behind them you know or the person with them or beside them, however you want to say it that's a fact and so i remember being at the tony robbins conference that i'd already paid god how much has it yeah in palm beach this would have been at the one you're talking about the tony robbins conference i paid 10 grand to be there yep and, and I was asking you, I was like, you paid 10 grand. And I was like, how did you get yourself to do that? Yeah, it was scary. And it was extra scary that that was already in the off season. You know how it is in Michigan, right? You know how the weather is where you're at. Well, the same way in Illinois. Off season, things are slowing down. You're like, I don't have a bunch of money coming in. And so right before I'd met you, I was in Palm Beach at the other one. And uh, it comes up that they're like, hey, you can get buy one or uh, – buy one, get two or whatever. And so you could go to the next version of this and it's going to be in Amsterdam in the next like eight months. And I go outside and I'm like, this buy one, get one deal. I call my wife and I say, Hey, should I do this? We don't have the money to do this at all. Uh, I'll be pulling 10 grand off the line of credit, but if we do it, 
take our office manager in Illinois and it'll change your life. And she said, I don't know why you even called. You should go back in there and buy it. And that's how, and, but I've been lucky to have that. Like she's always like with all the financial stuff I say, I struggle with. She's like, Jacob, you've been like this all your life. You stress over these things. And I've never once seen something bad actually happen. Something bad comes up and you figure it out. And so, yeah, I've spent tons of money. I've spent tons and tons of money on personal development. And um, does that mean you should go out and spend those? I, I, it's, if you are drawn to it or called to do it or feel like it's going to be life changing. It was for me. I know the Zoe, the person I'm talking about that I took as my office manager. Now she wants to be a life coach. She's in on Tony Robbins forever. She's like, it, it, it helped her so much and all that stuff helped me a ton too. So um, yeah, a hundred percent. I got a ton of value out of it. Unfortunately, I love Grant Cardone stuff. The event you went to, um, I love the 10X Growth Cons. Unfortunately, 10X Growth Cons are not the most value driven. It's more excitement and fluff where there's a lot of other stuff where I got like straight gold out of. And I feel like you picked a bigger event that was good. The best part of the event that we saw each other at was that I paid for a high dollar ticket and I was behind the stage for a lot of time networking. You know, and that's not going back to saying everybody should spend a lot of money. But, yes, you can get a gob from these events. And um, there's a million times in my business, not just in these events where I've spent money that I didn't have to do things that uh, I didn't know how I was going to accomplish. I love it. I'm just letting all that sink in, bro. So, all right, I'll tie all this back in to. The question I didn't even ask is, how do you even know what your man hour rate is? How do you define that? How do you come up with that? What's the formula? Yeah, formula there. Well, we'll dumb it down because what I do is looks really complicated now because you can level up a little bit and a little bit for a really long time. I mean, most for the most part, that's a simple equation. What all does it cost you to run your business, right? This gets more complicated as there's more and more people. But so My, what minus owners pay. Owner salary, like what does it cost you to run the business? Owner's or or you add it all in. When I figure net, like when I say I want this net number, it's like I might take draws out of the net profit, but it's going to have some reasonable owner's wage in there, right? Maybe it's a lower owner's wage, maybe it's a higher, whatever. But so when I'm figuring all this stuff together, it's going to have owner's wage in. It's going to have everything in the budget. So when I look at my budget, it's going to have the the software we use, like all the overhead things, software, office people, me, um, anything, cell phones, right? All of that stuff added together. That's your straight up overhead. And then there's like all the cost of goods sold that go into making the job. That's your employees. That's your that's your uh, your your trucks, your mowers, your skidsters, your whatever, your uniforms for all of those people the fuel. And so there's these two different sectors. So there's the overhead and there's the cost of goods that actually makes all this happen. I, obviously people talk about material. I, I don't really budget material. Like material is something we just, you, you add markup to. So it's all about getting the man out right. So this is excluding any kind of like guess on material because material would only be a guess. You would have no real idea. Um, so we take all of these things and really the, the most rudimentary way, I've got a very, very basic version of this is we add it all together and we divide it by the assumed amount of hours we have to produce it over the course of a year, right? So if you have two people out there that are going to be producing work and they can work a hundred hours a piece a year, which I or say a thousand, right? It's probably closer to 2000 something, but say a thousand, then you would have if two people at a thousand, you have 2000 hours. And so you would divide what it costs you to do business by that number and that's working you towards a man hour rate and the but, only way you can get that accurate number you're talking about billable or non-billable are you talking about port to port like from the time they put the key in the truck or the time they actually punch in to punch yeah. out See, you're digging deeper and deeper we would have to get together look at an excel sheet and go down this to really get but yeah but so, then you have them clocking in and clocking out of jobs with the crm and you're tracking all the numbers that, right individual jobs but yes true my true numbers like i look to recover my overhead in eight man hours right so okay, that yeah. window to window port to port however you want to say it and the reason i've always said i recover overhead in eight hours is because if this made up budget that is hopefully as true as possible if you get into overtime then it's irrelevant because my overhead that's already recovered at 40 hours goes away so my 20 bucks an hour goes away 
per man hour. And now if I pay overtime, it's irrelevant because I've already recovered my overhead. So yes, that would be window to door to door. However you say it, that's when I'm looking at my hourly rate. And you can dig down into this stuff so much. So and it's a, for me on my spreadsheet, it's, I got to assume how many crews I'm going to have for this year. That comes from our goal, you know, and then that comes from how much can a crew do to figure out how many people are actually going to be there to spread that because it can draw down your pricing when you start getting a lot of people out there and you've got a lot of usable hours to spread all your costs across. Um, it's a big, big math equation. And to, to do it justice, it's it, like I said, it's a, it's a much deeper conversation. But the ultimate deal is it is how much it totally costs you to run your business, everything included, divided by the total amount of hours you've got to produce work. And then now with that, that's going to give you some kind of number. That is that's your break even number from your break even break even number. Now you add your margin to it. what do you want to make? And then that's when I'm going to assume I'm going to shoot for 30%. But in my business, it's not 30% on every service. It's a, it's a blended net profit that I want to make. So maybe I make 15% mowing, but I make 40% spraying lawns. And then I make something in the middle landscaping. And then when they blend out, they're close to the goal I want to hit. Dude, I love that. How you're, you're actually kind of compartmentalizing Mm -hmm. the different services and figuring out the man hour rate and the profit margins for the services. And that makes perfect sense because the longer you, you put that trajectory out is that you can actually try to say, Oh, we're making more money here, less money here. But what are there some necessary evils like, like milk in a grocery store, they don't make any money off of it. It draws people in, they buy other stuff. Like what about lawn care specifically? Are you still maintaining a, a profit margins on lawn care or is it an, an access point to all this other business? I'm not into running loss leaders. Um, so, so I want to make money on every day of the business or and, you're not doing it. Like you said earlier, you're out. Yeah. And because ultimately like lawn care, everybody says you can't make money. Like I've got this person and I, I hate it for him because I wish I could help him. But someone who's coming on the YouTube channel and he must be in Southwest Florida. And he always says like, you can't make money here. I told you I made money here. And it was like, after a video where I just said we were making a 20% net profit. I'm like, I, I don't know where you missed the profit thing, but like so many people have that opinion. Right. And then, so they think they can't make money mowing grass. Like we don't focus on mowing grass. That's what makes this easy. We focus on landscaping. We have really high prices on mowing. And so, yeah, we get a lot of requests. We don't land that many of them, but we slowly build up a really profitable route because our focus was not on mowing. It was over here on landscaping. But we oh, can so if you're going to do mowing, it's going to be profitable or you ain't doing the shit. Yeah, exactly. Now there are caveats, right? I'm going to go sit down with someone and they do like 450 to half a million dollars worth of mowing here in Florida. And I know that if it's profitable enough and I sprinkle all those lawns into my route, I'm going to be able to be even more profitable on the stuff I already do. Because if I can mow the whole block instead of just mowing one house, it could be advantageous to take those on. So there are things that like I would have to evaluate differently than my normal way. But yes, normally I, I, I'm setting out for that 10 or 15 percent profit, even on mowing, because the other deal is I want to be able to pay my team members more. I want them to have a better job. I want them to have benefits. I don't want to have to deal with like competing like over a dollar. That's stupid. I want to have stuff on our side where people want to be here and won't leave. Yes. So it takes, and that's why I tell them, it's like, I'd love to take everybody to like a Tony Robbins conference, this and go do that. And I want to love to fly everybody to Florida for a Christmas party. So instead of doing two huge blowout Christmas parties, like we do now, we could just do the one company wide Christmas party. All things take profit. And that's why it's so important to be able to make sure you have good profit. Awesome. All right. At this time, I'll transition into some of the comments because people have been waiting. I see a Mac from Mac, Lawn Care to a Million, Lockman, right. Fred Likens, Rich Blood, Jeff D'Angelo. What's up? Jim Duffin, Austin Butler. A couple comments right here. Total revenue. And actually, can you read the comments? Can you see them? Yeah, I can read it. You want me to read it? Mm -hmm. Tiny. So excuse my squinting. Uh, total revenue divided by total man hours to perform revenue. Plan equals man hour cost divide man hour cost by res reciprocal of percentage you want for profit selling man hour rate. <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent, 
but it sounds like it's in a in a thought out direction. I just he was just he just he was going along with what you were saying. He said that's it. This is I got what you're saying, bro. Yeah, that's what he was saying. And the math shakes out. That's what matters. That's what matters. And a lot of times I say stuff so fast. And it was good. And and thank you, uh, uh, Fred Likens. Thank you for that. Appreciate that, bro. Mac for Mac. Oh, Mac for M four N. I see him all the time. He's cool. What does he say? Oh God. Yeah, that's. That's been me because I find people are so hard to manage. Uh, wins lunch. I need to. Uh, I need the bog. Chatting to anyone that'll listen. Ha <laughs> ha. Landscape laborers are a nightmare. See, if you always say landscape laborers are a nightmare, you're gonna make them all a nightmare. That's the problem. Is you know, if I say Keith is, if I say some negative thing, I just impose my thoughts on you. And, and fortunately, you do that with our team. Like, I, I'm not trying to get down on what you're saying at all, dude, because I get it can be frustrating. And there's times where in my mind, I'm like, dude, it's just how am I going to make this work? But ultimately, you have to know that if a company has got big out there, I, I got a company 35 minutes away from me, and they might have the craziest employees in the world. I don't know, but they do 100 and 15 million a year with 1100 employees and like so if someone can do that you could do anything in your company and so having that mindset of like employ you can't make money mowing that's bullshit that's a broken mindset like you can make money mowing you can make money doing anything you just have to charge the right amount sell the right kind of people same thing here like laborers are a nightmare i mean there are a lot of struggles with employees but i would rather have a lot of employees and be able to bring value to them and create opportunities for people than not have any employees at all because i also want to make a lot of money and have them make a lot of money so Rich Blood here says, shit ton of work is deter- the determining factor, clearly, but how to jump from solo operator making enough for time spent over to many employees running the business while I oversee? I don't know if that was a question no, or not. I feel like it's a, I think it's a question without a question mark. A shit ton of work is the determining factor. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, like if you want to figure out on how to get out of like, uh, we'll sum this up and be more concise this time, not go off on a trail. Um, If you just focus on marketing, sales and production and consistently focus on getting better and better and better at each one, you're going to be able to have that big load of work. That's the deal, though. Same thing people won't do. They always put the cart in front of the horse. They say, once I make money, I'll market. Well, that's kind of backwards. You have to market a lot so people will know about you so you can get the work and make it happen. Um, so, so yeah, you got to have a lot of work and that whole transition, that takes a lot of time. And you've got to start putting people in place and you've got to just focus on those three things all the time and grow and grow and grow it. And you'll grow yourself out of where you're in the field doing the work because you'll have to be selling stuff. You have to transition to focusing on sales. Well, I'm going to be full transparent. I'm at the point now where even – dealing i love customers i love all my clients and customers but even walking around a property with a customer performing a, a sales quote on a property walk and talking to the customer and writing up the quote mm-hmm. makes me want to jump out of my skin like i i feel like uh my time is so scarce and, yep. and so valuable that i can't even do that anymore it's like and i'm, I'm doing it but it's i'm super qualifying each customer and i almost feel like uh I don't want to give off a negative five to the customers and lower my closing rate, yeah. but I'm ju- I'm just trying to be tip of the spear, bro. And it's uh, going through some growing pains myself. And we got Carmen Knowles here says, uh, you make more money mowing seven months than if you work 40 hours a week all year, 12 year round. What does that mean? Like uh, a job or something? I think they're just saying, yeah, you make more money mowing grass than if you have a job. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, definitely. If you're out on your own, you... A lot of people don't like accountability in general, and it's total accountability to be out on your own and you control what you earn. And so if you don't earn a lot of money, it's your fault. And if you earn a lot of money, that's also your fault. Kent Petras says, how do you know when you're at the point where you can start to hire office people and or managers? So good question. Yeah, great question. Great question. Uh, I've heard a lot of how do you know when you're ready to have your first kid? Uh, it's also extremely hard to figure out and everybody most people that have a kid weren't ready and didn't plan it and then it happened and then they figured it out and this stuff happens the exact same way other than you get a little better opportunity to plan for me 
when I was doing 250 or 300,000 in revenue, it was already coming unraveled for me to manage stuff. And so I was getting someone in the office. So this is about starting early and trying to understand how you're going to have profit and be profitable. And then you're going to, once you get to a certain point, for me, that was the point, 250, 300,000. But when we started Florida, before we were even making that, we hired someone in the office because I know we couldn't scale unless I put someone in the office so I could go sell all day long and could answer the phone. Um, but if I was looking for it and I'd been transitioning through the business phases for a while, that's that's a decent number, I, I would say, right there. And when you do it, when I did that at the 250, 300,000 mark, it didn't feel comfortable. I didn't know how I was going to afford it. But I realized I couldn't, afford, I couldn't afford not to do it. And it exponentially grew my company when someone was there to manage customer service and answer the phone all the time and make sure stuff was instant. And that's how we've always kept it. Now in Illinois, we've got four four people in the office and we've got three people in Florida right now. And we have an answering service on top of that to catch even more calls so the phone doesn't go unanswered. So people don't hire because out of scarcity without realizing that if you put someone in the office, how much more you could actually have. I love it. Great answer. Oh, he's just agreeing. He doesn't do property walks anymore. He makes the customers upload photos and the info he needs. Some stuff, man. I, I, I do have customers send me pictures and I can quote some things, but there's a lot of stuff. I've, I've done that and I've gotten to the job and be like, oh, shit. I just quoted something over a picture and it looks way different. Yep. And um, but there are things you can have them quote over a picture. That's true. I like that. Um, James Dawson says, why visit each job since? COVID, I get a description, two or three photos and the address. I can look up on Google Earth so much better. Can sort of the waste, not a waste of time. So yeah, and with the window cleaning business, we do 100% on Google Earth. If we have to get better pictures, we look at the house on Zillow and we can basically see every single window and skylight on the house. Maybe we might miss a skylight, but it's worth it to not have to drive there. But if I can get away to do video chats or something, I, I like this idea of not having to do in-person quotes. Now, I, I want to hit on that, what he just said, oh, and or yeah. Google, the thing the next guy said, too. Um, you can do a lot. It doesn't even have to be hardcore. I guess it's hardcore pre-qualifying. I have pre-sold, uh, I think, I mean, I don't know. It could be any number, but I've pre-sold like a twenty-seven dollars or $30,000 landscape project without going there just by meeting with a person, doing phone consults, having Google Earth, having some pictures, knowing what they want. And we've got our numbers broken down enough where we can be in the ballpark really, really close. Like any softscape install, I would darn near feel comfortable doing it all off of Google Earth, but there's still stuff you're going to see when you get there in person. And, um, but so I can be within a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand bucks on a, on a $30,000 job. And then I know and haven't wasted anybody's time. And then I can say, you know, hey, and then we can come out and finalize this. And that's when you can give me the deposit check if, if this number sounds good to you. So, so that's another way we do that. Well, Dude, there, that's very clear what you're talking about. So you're very, you're qualifying the customer of the home, phone and you're basically sub communicating, Hey, I'm going to serve you as the highest level at the highest level that I can, but I'm not driving all, all the way across town and coming to meet with you unless I'm collecting a signature and a deposit check. Yeah. And I'm sending a, I'm sending that quote too. Like that's not, they're not, not getting a quote. I'm giving them a quote based off of that phone console and that time spent that one, it was 45 minutes away and I didn't want to drive up there unless it was for sure. And it ended up, I think it ended up being over $30,000 project because he kept adding to it. Um, but I did all of that, sent them the quote and I just put in the, the notes that this is not final until sidewalk, you know? And so I ah. think to, Hey, this is where it's going to be close to be. And yeah, there's so much in sales where you can talk to them about, you know, if this was, if this is going to be a little bit more because there's something we didn't see on the pictures or on Google earth, is there going to be any issues with that? And then you already know, like they're going to tell you, well, no, I mean, we got more budget to work with. I would like to keep it there. And you're already building rapport before you even go out and meet them and saving them time too. Bro. That's so, so it's like, Oh my God, I could be doing that right now. So these customers, like we have all these arborvitaes around the pool and we want them trimmed. We want the, these things transplanted and we want some decorative stone here. And I could be like, okay, send me some pictures close and far, about seven, eight pictures. So they send me the pictures. I can look at it and call, Hey Bob, it's Keith with Kelfus Landscaping. I looked at everything thoroughly. We've done this a thousand times and I've done a thousand jobs just like this. And I can tell you right now over the phone, you're within, in the range of 
38 to 4200 bucks does that yep. sound right bob now this is just over the phone it's not you know contract and when i get there it could be within a you know 10 percent difference yeah but does that sound good so if the customer is saying yes and they like that that's within their budget then we take it to the next step where i'll actually go out there and get a signature and a deposit yeah. but and there's can, no point in going dude and you can put that wording one step further you can say what you just said hey it's going to be between the two thousand and four thousand dollar range uh are there any questions about that oh no there's no questions okay so if i go out is there any reason that you would not say yes sign and give me a deposit if it's within that range can we at least agree that when we go out there in that range you're ready to go so i mean you can take the conversation even further uh, there's so much stuff with sales a lot of this though for us is yeah when it's big and it's far away because here in florida we're starting to web out for large projects to areas that are 45 minutes and an hour away and we want to know that if to get out there we want to know that it's qualified and nobody's wasting their time Bro, I feel like I'm getting paid right now just being here right now. <laughs> hey, great. That's that's all I ever want. Like well, that's the only reason I got a YouTube channel. I, don't, I want the I want people to learn and do better in the business so less people complain about not being able to make money. It's just like any business. You can make money if you do it well. And there's anybody can do it well. I'm not a super educated person. I'm not even that smart. Like I I just keep asking questions and get a little bit better all the time and you can do anything. I love it, bro. Dr. Lawns Yard and Property Maintenance. Keith, I've been listening to your podcast for two years, going on three years. Thank you. Thanks, bro. Appreciate you. This is on the Untrapped podcast with Keith Kelfis on all podcast platforms. I, uh, it's not iTunes anymore. It's Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all of them. Just type in Keith Kelfis or Untrapped podcast. It pops up. And so if you are just tuning in now, I'm with Jacob Godar. 3.6 million, two locations, lawn and landscape business, super successful dude. And um, we're going to get to a couple more comments and then we'll jump off here. But I want to make sure I acknowledge you because I like to keep these under an hour or a little over an hour now. But adversity creates opportunity, says Sunset Mowing. And I'm reading them now because you said you had to squint to read them. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's good. That's good. Okay. Jeff Razek, Dilly Dilly. What up, though? Carmen Noel. He says, I gave prices over the phone in the past. Never again. You had a bad experience, but don't let yeah. it stop you. But but that that's the deal, though. So that's I hope that I hope he's still on. Listen to this. Yes. If you gave prices over the phone and stuck to them, that's a problem. If you were to say it's going to be Keith says, we've got the Arbor Vitis. They're huge. They're green giants. They're massive. And we're going to trim them for this. And he gets there and is like, dude, that picture did not do those justice. We could not see how far in the fence or whatever the case they made. <laughs> and it and you get there and the power lines are going through them. Yeah, the power lines through the whole thing. And if you say, I will trim it for $1,500, point blank and done and done, that's not how you do it. You say, here's the range, the price that it's going to be close. I've got to do a final site walk for verification. All it is really to do is pre-qualify. And if you're good at what you're doing, hopefully you're at least close. You know, this this situation you're talking about, Cameron, is a situation where you are not close and you need a disclaimer that that was not the final price. Yes, because the customer could take a picture of the quote unquote arborvitaes at the, and they're standing up five feet higher in the hill. And then you didn't realize the bottom of it. The mugs yep. are like 28 feet and you can't even get to them without a spider lift machine. Yeah. And you don't own a spider lift or now you got to spend 1200 renting one crazy stuff for all right uh javier mas masias how do i say his last name m-a-c-i-a-s man i'm not sure i'm not good with names no. what software do you guys use to run numbers i know we use jobber software for all the quotes and invoicing and billing and customer follow-up go to getjobber.com keith to get my exclusive discount and we use quickbooks what do you use so like a lot of our number running stuff in to build up uh, budget and whatnot all so we pretty much uh, all of our running business stuff which does all of our costing all of our numbers all of our clocking in and out that's all service autopilot so do you use google sheets and service autopilot yep good answer I like that okay yeah we use google sheets that we use my bookkeeper sends me a google sheets and then everything on a pdf yep. i just met with my accountant Literally, I just got back from doing quotes and was with my accountant before this and back on the horn with the bookkeeper, getting everything finalized and just finished the taxes. It was awesome. You I finished did, I don't, time this year? Huh? Did you, you finished your taxes for last year? 
Well, corporate taxes were due March 15th, but personal taxes, April 15th. Yeah. Why? I just never, I, I, I just live in the land of where they get extended every year. I'm never before October 15th. And you're looking at me like that's crazy, <laughs> but I, no, I don't it's, If you can get an extension. Yeah. I, I just, I didn't know. I was going to congratulate you because we, we're usually trying to tie up so many loose ends that it seems like it never happens. But, um, I'm but booking out entire days to do taxes, uh, one to two days on the calendar before uh, the only because I've I'm I'm scared that I have. And to be transparent, I have had friends that just scare the crap out of me. Like, well, you better you can pay Uncle Sam or he's going to come after you, bro. So I'm calling my accountant, the bookkeeper. I, I anno actually annoy them. I'm calling them like crazy and emailing them and asking them so many questions and running all these scenarios to the point where I oversave for taxes. And yeah. um, and every year when i finally you know get everything finalized i'm like Phew. like i make it up to be this huge thing i yeah. that's <laughs> sorry i have a question for you i haven't got to really ask you anything one question how huh. often do you meet with your accountant i talk to my accountant on the phone every quarter but we only meet once a year now and we do everything over google drive mm -hmm. that's Dump all Something that's been really good for me that I think makes me not feel as worried about it, I guess, is every month, like at the end, like if the end of this month, usually by the 15th or the 20th of the next month, we're going over the numbers, we're going over where we're at, and how they think, am I have any blind spots that I'm missing? And then by October, the following year, or in October, that's when we're talking the tax game. Do we need to buy stuff? Or because we're always investing and growing. And so then we're trying to smash, potentially smash our tax bill if we have investments that need to be made uh, to, to better our business into the future. So uh, just thought I'd ask because I know I, so many people don't meet with their accountant that much and it's not super, super expensive. We just do it over the phone, do a quick rundown. Tell me the, tell me what they've came out on the final numbers after everything was reconciled, reconciled for the, the previous month. And um, just to, just to know we're pointing in the right direction. I love it. I do yeah, talk to the bookkeeper yeah, every week. Huh? No, I mean, I guess my bookkeeper texts me a lot, but the accountants every month, every month we meet with them and go over it. But we're to the point now where like anything, I mean, I've got personal number for the bookkeeper that works for the accountant. She's texting me like she's running information there for a while. They're giving us weekly uh, consolidated P and L's like, um, I've went from trying to do too much, like we're weekly was too much. Now we're back to monthly. You know, we used to be at quarterly. So we're always trying to like play around with what's the right amount of information. We realized that weekly was so much so fast that it was never that good because you start at the beginning of the month and a consolidated PL in the first seven days is a total mess because it just doesn't have enough stuff on it yet. So you probably got a lot more stuff going on me than I as well. You're at like 3.6 million. I'm but still, still at like, all. Huh? It all compiles though. So it, whether it's a hundred dollars or, or 10, 10, 10 million dollars, you know, like it, it, if you start it small and it keeps building up with you, it just builds good habits. I, it's something I wish I would have done. I, I fought with trying to get a good accountant for years. And now I, I got so much peace of mind just meeting with the accountant every month. Worst case scenario in a rush or in tax season, we might go two months. Um, but I still think it's important whether there's a lot going or not. So just throwing it out there. No, I like that. I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to call my accountant and say, Hey, can we, can we meet monthly? Cause I'm obsessed with being on top of everything and looking for blind spots. I found a blind spot. That was my fault, not communicating with the bookkeeper. I basically have an American express card that you can pay off over time with no interest. So I made purchases on it through the media business. And then he makes a journal entry in QuickBooks and then it's a tax write off. It's a, if it's a legit business expense, well, yep. like I have an American express express card, I'm getting haircuts and we're going out to eat on it. And some of those are actually legit write offs that the business meeting ones, but, yep. and so, but he can only see the transactions on his end and he doesn't see what everything is for. And I just thought he knew, uh, because everything's completely categorized, but we have like 21 different streams of income trickling and in from all the internet stuff and all the, so it's, it's complex. So it just got lost in the mix. And I went through everything with a fine tooth comb and I, I go back to my book here where I'm like, Hey, we have to fix this. So then I had to go through, cause I'm like Amazon. I have like four different credit cards plugged in cause I'm making business yeah. transactions and I alternate which credit card. So it state keeps the books organized. Does this yeah. make sense? Yeah. So 
I, anyways, I had to go through and create a spreadsheet and have them make separate journal entries. And it took a few days. And then we had to go back to the accountant and then get everything fixed and finalized just in time. <laughs> yep. They're always on top of me because like, we're like, it's like a marriage with us in the accountant at this point. Yeah. Every single account. They've got the log ons for every bank account credit card account they can get in they can look at anything and everything and um yeah i'll get texts all the time like what was this random amount of money you know yeah (laughs) verifying things so uh actually i can't say that okay and i will say because people like what's he talking about i um a friend called me and scared the crap out of me like a month ago he's like bro you need to take your some money out of the bank i was like what do you mean he's like the banks are gonna crash so uh, I, yeah, I went to the bank and I request requested because uh, they won't give you money on the spot. You have to request it and they have to you have to fill out a thing. And it's like so I was going to with. Yeah, I was going to withdraw a sum of cash out of the bank because I was a little nervous. And then I told my friend about it, who is a, a, a also a consultant. He's like, no, 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 don't do that. Go, don't go take a bunch of money out of the bank because then it's going to trigger the IRS and it's going to look fishy and you're going to have to fill out a form and then they're going to look at your accounts because it looks weird taking a whole bunch of money out of the bank. So then I went back in the bank with my face red and I was kind of, I was like, Hey, I don't need to take that money out of the bank because I was just a little nervous. They're like, everybody's nervous right now. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. And then I walked out of the bank. Like, so. <laughs> yeah. I, it's crazy. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. What's saying in the middle of that is just total BS that you have to go in and pre request to get money out of the bank. It's crazy what money is and how little people know about it but it's a whole different story it's all derivatives and uh yeah okay let's look at these co-mingling rich blood rudy rotor any advice finding a good accountant how do you know when it's time to look for a new accountant (sighs) if you're constantly frustrated with um the situation with your accountant, you don't feel like numbers are there. You don't feel like things are right. You don't feel, you feel like you always have to ask for stuff. It's probably the time. You probably outgrown your accountant too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and everybody starts small. Like we had a friend liked her. She was great for a little while. Um, well, ultimately what I've realized is I don't want people just blowing my head up, just trying to make me happy. I would rather somebody just be, Hey, you're an idiot. You're doing it wrong. You know, that's a much better relationship to me than trying to make me feel good. And that's kind of where I felt at one point. I felt like they were just, uh, it was more fluffing me up and think I'm doing well. And I was also having to like kind of beg and try to get things done. It wasn't a timely enough manner for what we were growing into. And it was time to, to find someone. And, and, and as far as it goes, just like for hiring an employee or hiring marketing people or whatever, I mean, get referrals find someone online and then tell me, I, I want to talk to three other people you work with that have got a company like what we've got. Bro, I love everything that you just said. It was so fun having you on the show. I'm going to end it here. Jacob Godar, how can people find you? What's your YouTube channel, bro? Just Jacob Godar right on YouTube. Jacob Godar on Instagram, uh, Jacob Godar on Facebook. Uh, the company's the is- Lawn care. If you ever want to check out any of that stuff, Grow by Design is the podcast. Um, a lot of really cool stuff there. The the coaching group is actually on jacobgodar.com. That is Growcom, and um, those are all areas you can find out about everything we have going on. Okay, so Jacob Godar, G O D A R, on all social media platforms, including YouTube. Your podcast is Grow by Design. Yep. If people want to learn of how to work with you, you do you off? Uh, I'm not trying to tell you to pitch or anything, but if you have a website, jacobgodar.com. Yep. Jacob Godar, same, same spelling, everything.com. And you can find out more there about the coaching group that opens up quarterly. We're always bringing on new members into that really, really cool atmosphere there. And um, yeah. Dude, I love it, bro. Thanks so much for being on my show. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. We'll see you next time on the Untrapped Podcast tomorrow at 4 p.m. Tune in. We got Tommy Mello, 4 p.m. And thanks so much. Thank you for having me.